to a very special two-man edition of the Daily Fantasy Edge. My name is Adam Levitan. I, of course, am one of the analysts here at DraftKings. As always, I am joined by Al Zeidenfeld. Peter, personal, absent from today's podcast, you will be graced by only the voices of myself and Mr. Smizzle himself as we go game by game through the week eight slate. Al, what's going on? I'm doing good. You know, weather's nice. I'm feeling, I mean, just look, man. Weather couldn't be nicer here in Los Angeles. I'm wearing shorts, talking about football with you, Adam. Couldn't be a better day. Yeah, uh, it's a beautiful thing. I'm used to hosting the solo pod in which we talk about all kinds of disgusting and disturbing things. I'm not used to talking uh, normally about football, but I'm going to give it my best. And Al is actually going to be the one that takes us game by game. And he's going to throw the notes to me because we were talking before the show and we thought it would be odd for me to say the game and throw the notes to myself. So, I mean, it would just put a lot of extra pressure on producer Luke <laughs> to have to do like split screens and cutting things and like, you know, it's not like you're Phoebe Buffay from Friends and you've got Ursula, your twin sister, and you're just going to be talking to each other. It would take a lot of post-production work. So in order to get it out to the people, uh, the seven people who still listen to this podcast, we thought that we'd just keep it simple. Uh, the Listener League is up. Uh, the, I believe it's down to 5,000, which uh, is still a massive tournament. Uh, it still needs to be filled. Uh, it is still rake-free. It is still a flat payout. Uh, where it has resumed being a flat payout, I should say. So get in there, DK Playbook, find the logo, find the link. I'm done with that bit of uh, talking about how to get in there. So go ahead. You guys know how to get in. Get in the Listener League. And with that, Al, why don't you tee us up with the first game? All right, first game on the schedule, we got the Seahawks visiting the hapless Atlanta Falcons. Is Matt Ryan going to play? Is Matt Ryan not going to play? Is the Falcons defense going to be able to stop the Seahawks offense? Which is going to be the premier bird in week eight. Adam, give me the news and notes. You just did the news and notes. You're talking about Matt Ryan. You're talking about that. The no, defense. I presented it as a damn question. You're supposed to answer the flipping question. All right. All right. Uh, Matt Ryan. I mean, he says he wants to play. Uh, he says that um, he's going to gut it out. Uh, I don't know why. I mean, they're one and six. Uh, it's over for them. I believe they have a bye in week nine. Would not surprise me at all if Matt Ryan sat. But as of now, I consider him a true Game time decision question we're recording this uh, noon Eastern on Thursday. If Matt Ryan can't go, Matt Schaub will get in there. And Matt Schaub is extremely old. Last time we saw Matt Schaub, he was just an absolute pick six machine. He, I thought he looked okay in the preseason this year on opportunities, but he was close to getting beat out by Kurt Benkirk before Kurt Benkirk went down. So, uh, you know, it would be hard to have a lot of faith in the Falcons guys. And I actually think Matt Schaub starting is worse for the Seahawks guys, too, if that happens, just because it's just so much less likely that Matt Ryan and that Falcons offense will be able to put pressure on Russ to raise his volume. Other news and notes, uh, Mohamed Sanu has been traded. And, uh, you know, quietly big news. I mean, Mohamed Sanu had a 14% target share. He was averaging six, seven targets per game. We'll see more Calvin Ridley in the slot. We'll see Calvin Ridley in all packages now before Calvin Ridley was only in certain packages because Sanu kind of stepped on him a little bit. We'll now see Calvin Ridley in all packages. So uh, I think that's Notable, but maybe, maybe only notable if Matt Ryan plays out. Am I to assume that this game is off the board, both in terms of uh, just being able to spread bet it or the total? Because the total opened extremely high at 54, right? Some great offensive options in this game. Both defenses can't really stop what the other team brings to the table. Uh, so how do you think, I mean, obviously quarterback is the one thing that's going to affect totals, team totals uh, combined over unders. Where do you think this would be if Ryan doesn't go total opened at 54, assuming he would, where does it go if Ryan doesn't play? What are we talking about? Like a 47? Like how much is he going to affect uh, the over under in this game? Yeah, I think for the straight line, I would say Matt Ryan to Matt Shaw is probably like a seven point difference um, in terms of the mm -hmm. over under. Yeah, uh, you know, 47 sounds right. That, that sounds like a good guess. Okay, so basically it changes the way that we look at everything because with Matt Ryan in, this game looked like it was one that was going to shoot out. We can play multiple offensive uh, pieces from both teams. Russ Wilson becomes one of the best plays on the slate. If he's in, albeit an extremely expensive option, you could pair him with somebody like Tyler Lockett or uh, my favorite regression to the mean candidate, DK Metcalf, with as many red zone and end zone looks as he's had and just hasn't connected with Russell. Who And Russell, one of the most efficient 
touchdown conversion quarterbacks of all time, 6.1 touchdown percentage on his career. Shocking that he has not really converted with DK Metcalf. So I'd expect that to uh, kind of trend upward as the weeks went on. But if this looks like a game where the Falcons can't keep up, obviously with the volume that Chris Carson has gotten, uh, it appears that it could be the type of game where Chris Carson getting his 20 to 25 touches in a game might be a little bit more valuable against a Falcons team that is just bad, even though they've been better against opposing running backs than against quarterbacks and wide receivers and pass catchers. So mm -hmm. uh, I know which pieces I want to play. I've literally just mentioned every one of them. It's just going to be a manner in which way we roll them out based on how the news and notes go. Do you agree with that, Adam, or, or am I way off? Oh, yeah, for sure. And we're certainly in a holding pattern until we find out Matt Ryan's mm -hmm. status. Yeah, I mean, Chris Carson, we know what the Seahawks want to do. Rashad Penny got two snaps last week. Uh, Chris Carson got almost every snap. They mixed in CJ Procise just a little bit. And that was a game in which they were trailing uh, for much of the game uh, against the Ravens. So, so yeah, I, I think uh, obviously a, a very good spot for Chris Carson, who uh, you can make cases still underpriced at 7K, I think, even though his price started to climb. The only guy in there you didn't mention who I think is certainly in play is Tyler Lockett, who, you know, if yeah. Russ happens to drop back uh, 35 times, we know that Tyler Lockett is going to be extremely efficient in this matchup. I mean, one of the best matchups that Tyler Lockett can have. So yeah, he's yeah. Uh, he's just hashtag good. Yep. And All right, uh, so shout out to De shout out to Devontae Freeman, who we both played last week and tried to yeah. fight Aaron Donald and got kicked out of the game. <laughs> and he got Darth Vader. He got lifted off the ground, feet dangling. Way to go, dude. Pick a fight with the biggest, baddest dude on the planet. That's just, I mean, when keeping it real goes wrong yeah, was, was exactly funny. what happened to Devonta last week. All right, moving on uh, from a, what could be a very exciting game to one that might be a little bit more of a snooze fest. The Colts host the Broncos. 6.5 point favorites are the Colts. Low over under in this game. We did have a big trade that's going to affect the usage rates for the Broncos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Shane Pete is not on the pod today because one of the biggest uh, moments in the history of uh, uh, the Jennings family, Emmanuel Sanders has been traded to the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, you know, it's just time. I mean, Manny was a free agent, seemed like he wasn't a pending free agent, wasn't that happy anyways. Uh, and now they get uh, to take a longer look at Deshaun Hamilton, who it seems like they've been somewhat disappointed with this year, but hasn't really had a big opportunity either we saw Deshaun Hamilton down the stretch what he does uh, he runs extremely short routes he's a a really good route runner knows how to get open underneath uh it would be surprising if he made any big plays down the field particularly in this game against the Colts defense which tries to keep everything in front of them but we can project and it's not a lock but we can project uh Deshaun Hamilton to uh play every snap across from Corlin Sutton now uh, Deshaun Hamilton is only 3,300. Obviously, that is extremely, extremely cheap. And I've played uh, much, much worse guys uh, than Deshaun Hamilton for 3,300. Uh, i just not sure about the ceiling on him. And that's something I'm going to keep looking into as the week uh, kind of goes on. Yeah, he's not your usual type of play. But based on median projections being where they are for, for Deshaun Hamilton, I mean, he's friend of the podcast, Matt Harmon, absolutely gushed over him last season in terms of his route running ability, his separation ability, all those sorts of things, but he never really got over 50 yards receiving in a game. But the last four games of last season, I think Adam, you tweeted something like this out as well, over six catches and nine plus targets per game in those four games. If we get that sort of service, albeit from Joe Flacco, I don't care. He's going to be the number two guy in terms of uh, target percentage on this team. Now that Emmanuel Sanders is gone at 3,300, the floor is very real. Do we have access to a ceiling at all? Or do we have to go to Cortland Sutton, who now is locked in as the number one guy and not fighting anybody else for those downfield throws uh, from Flacco and definitely more red zone and end zone looks? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I like Cortland Sutton. I'm not sure this is the exact right matchup for him, given the way Indy plays. But yeah, I mean, Cortland mm -hmm. Sutton, you can make a good case that uh, he has asc ascended to true uh, number one status. And I, actually, what you know, what Joe Flacco does best, I think, still is throw the ball down the field. It's not kind of, uh, you know, dink and dunk his best ball is deep. Doesn't mean that he won't be checking it down uh, plenty here. So, so yeah, it's an interesting game. I do expect Chris Harris to spend a lot of time on T.Y. Hilton uh, mm -hmm. in this game. It's certainly a difficult matchup for T.Y. does not mean that he can't uh, win it. Um, by the way, you know, all the, the, the Colts uh, fans that, you know, who like misunderstood my tweet about why uh, I was tilted about people uh, citing like seven-year-old stats on on T.Y. Hilton as soon as he scored the touchdown I mean they were all over oh, it. they yeah. were like oh they were they were not <laughs> <laughs> they were I mean, all Adam, over it 
have you never have you not learned never be wrong on the internet i wasn't even wrong he wasn't <laughs> I, I said he was a, i said he was a great play just not for those reasons that's the sick part they yeah, just don't understand that because they don't play DFS. They're just like blindly rooting for laundry, you know? So it's always so, like yeah. Colts fan four nine seven eight two, right? Yeah. It's, it's just it, and or like it, they've got Indianapolis as their city, right? They're like, hey, just Johnny, Johnny Bravo at Johnny Bravo, but Indianapolis is there with like a big blue background behind their their profile picture. Uh with Hilton in a tough matchup, Marlon Mack, you know he's gonna get the volume. They're home, they are favored by about a touchdown. I understand that Marlon Mack has been in good situations before this year, and he's kind of floundered a little bit last week, kind of being one of them, only 44 yards on the ground. We saw uh, 11 touches from him against Oakland, but that's a game where they were trailing. We have seen more usage for him in the past game uh, with six catches in the last two weeks total. I think he's got a bit more of a floor here with the upside of a, a possible ceiling if he can find the end zone, and it's very possible with the matchup against uh, uh, that Hilton has on the outside. Moving on. The Buccaneers and the Titans. Uh, Titans favored by two and a half, total of 46. We know how bad the Buccaneers have been against the pass. Uh, Adam's going to talk to you, I assume, about them being a reverse funnel. Uh, are there any other news and notes that we need to think about in this game? Yeah, I mean, Bucks came out of the bye uh, healthy. And so, except for O.J. Howard, who I saw mispractice, but I mean, nobody really cares about O.J. Howard anymore anyways. Uh, yeah, I mean, the big news from last week was Ryan Tannehill, you know, uh, I was wrong. You know, I thought that he would be kind of a lateral move from Marcus Mariota. I mean, Ryan Tannehill was more aggressive, uh, more accurate. Um, you know, Marcus Mariota was just out there like trying not to make mistakes. And it's hard to be successful in the NFL that way. And Ryan Tannehill was willing to let it rip. And I mean, God, he has like two really good receivers. I mean, AJ Brown and Corey Davis, I think are both really good. And he found them and he targeted them a combined 15 times in that game for like a 50% combined target share or something like that. And you know, they're still really cheap and they're playing the Bucks. So I expect AJ Brown and Corey Davis to be uh, pretty popular this week. We also have Delaney Walker news. He's been banged up, uh, had the knee issue. Now he rolled his ankle and played five snaps last week. And and Johnny Smith is a talented guy who would play uh, just about every snap if Delaney misses this game uh, against the Bucks. And it's Halloween season and the, uh, the zombie Tajay Sharp found his way into the end zone. He just kind of, you know, crept his way in and caught a touchdown pass just lumbered in there into the end zone is Tajay Sharp somebody that we're going to have to be concerned with that might vulture us or is that just an anomaly last week yeah so what they've been doing is I mean they haven't been playing Corey Davis and AJ Brown every snap for whatever reason they've been rotating yeah. those guys out a bit so I do think the top three is very clearly AJ Brown Corey Davis and Adam Humphreys that doesn't mm -hmm. mean they're going to be every down players right I mean AJ Brown's just so big and just should be a massive red zone target Dollywood Brown uh has been not, I mean, he's had the one really big game, but on three targets. But if his market share kind of trends to what it was last week against the Chargers with eight targets, uh, he's somebody that I can really get behind at 4,100. I really don't want to play running backs against the Buccaneers. We've seen them shut down running back after running back after running back. Derrick Henry does appear to be too cheap, but this is a fade spot for me going up against Tampa Bay. And as far as Tampa Bay on offense... All the usage is essentially Winston to Godwin and to, to Mike Evans. You can single stack, double stack those guys. Uh, I don't think that this game shoots out. I think it stays somewhere around that total, close to about 46 total points. But the usage seems so consolidated that you could actually kind of sneaky game stack this one uh, without it having to get to 60 total points to pay off. You can get there on volume and touchdowns because everything is just so condensed uh, the way that this game and these teams tend to play. Yeah. Moving on to our next game, we got the car. Was there something else you wanted to say about this game? No, I was, I was going to say is, you know, I was doing the ownership projections and, and I don't uh -huh. think Godwin and Evans are going to be that no. owned. And I understand why, you know, Titans play slow and they have a pretty good defense. I don't think they've allowed more than 20 points in a game all year. And I would think it would be, you know, on the lower range of outcomes for Jameis and Godwin to Ev and Evans to, you know, like have an outlier like ceiling game. But it, it's certainly within. I mean, they're just so talented where I, I would never just write it off, you know. To me, it's more about the volume that they're getting. Like, if you take a look at their target market share, they're both, like, well over uh, into the 20s, around 25-plus for each of them. They also soak up, like, 50 to 60% of the red zone market share. So of the touchdowns that they may get, they're going to get the majority of the targets. You know that they're going to get the targets and catches. They're both downfield threats, and they're both the basically the two end zone threats uh, that exist for the Buccaneers. So uh, when I'm stacking... Uh, especially dangerously stacking, whatever, however you want to put it, like with teams that are 
lower expected totals, right? You can't just stack. It's not always like, well, the team that had the highest total ends up winning a tournament a stack from that game. It's not always how it works. Uh, so if you're kind of dangerous stacking, uh, going with guys that are going to get the majority of the touchdowns for their team and the majority of the volume for their team gives you a nice floor ceiling combo, even in what look, may not look like the most obvious ceiling type game. Saints are back at home. 8.5 uh, favorites uh, against the Cardinals. 48 total points expected in this game and a lot of injury news that's going to change the shape and uh, expectation of the value in this game at a lot of different positions. Adam, yeah. tell us all about it. Yeah, it's a good thing this is a one o'clock game. I mean, I could see David Johnson coming down to a game time decision. I could see Alvin Kamara coming down to a game time decision. I think we'll know early on Drew Brees whether he's going to play or not, but he's pushing to come back even though the Saints have a bye in week nine. We also have Christian Kirk. Uh, I think will be a question mark. Jared Cook will be a question mark. So, uh, you know, a lot of question marks here. Obviously, if David Johnson and Alvin Kamara miss, I would expect Chase Edmonds and Latavius Murray to be two of the highest owned uh, players in the slate. Chase Edmonds obviously was electric last week. Far, 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 far tougher matchup this week. I mean, New Orleans mm -hmm. defensive line is nasty and Arizona's offensive line is, is uh, hashtag not good. Um, and then you saw what Latavius was able to do up in Chicago. I know no Hakeem Hicks, but you know, uh, an impressive performance for Latavius in that offensive line. And, and yeah, I probably, I talked about it on the solo pod some, but I probably discounted um, how effective and, and how meaningful the Saints offensive line was going up to Chicago when doing Latavius Murray uh, projections. So yeah, it's interesting. You know, uh, I think Teddy has been just fine, you know, and, and whether Teddy starts or whether Drew Brees starts, Michael Thomas is going to be extremely, extremely popular. I do think Patrick Peterson didn't really shadow last week. Uh, I do think there's a chance that in this game with such little else that the Saints have in the past game, I, that they put Patrick Peterson on Michael Thomas. And it's hard to get a read on that. I mean, we haven't seen Patrick Peterson this year until last week when he was just kind of out there lumbering around. So I don't know. It's tough. It's a tough thing to say. I would certainly downgrade Michael Thomas slightly. I don't know if I would do it severely enough to, to be like, oh, I'm not playing Michael Thomas because Patrick Peterson might shadow him. No, I'm definitely not going to fade Michael Thomas in this spot. Uh, even at 8K, I don't know if we can fit him in cash. I mean, you could fit him in a cash game lineup, but obviously I tend to prioritize running backs over wide receivers. It's just more variance at wide receiver than there is at running back, especially when you consider the volume. Like if we get 10 targets out of a wide receiver or we get 25 to 30 touches out of a running back, I'm going to take the 30 touches from the running back and prioritize that personally. Uh, but Michael Thomas has just been an absolute uh, monster all season long, great floor with a possibility for a ceiling, regardless of who his quarterback is. But there was one injury that we didn't talk about uh, yet on this team uh, for the Saints, and that's Jared Cook. Uh, do you have anything on him? He did not practice on Wednesday. Obviously a fantastic matchup. All the tight end is really ugly this week, Adam. I really mm -hmm. think the tight end is very, very ugly. And it's kind of forcing me onto the higher dollar guys, right? I, I was just talking with... Uh, Daniel Dopp and Mike Clay about the, the tight ends that are available this weekend. All the ones that we like are like 4,900 to like the top, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's a value guy, it seems that it would be Jared Cook at 4K against Arizona, our favorite streamer uh, for tight ends against, uh, to stream tight ends against on all year. But like if Teddy's the quarterback, he hasn't really given him more than six targets in any of the weeks that he's been there. And now Cook dealing with this injury and not practicing Wednesday, which could always just be a veteran's day off, right? Uh, if he plays and Teddy's the quarterback, I'm a little less interested than if Drew Brees plays uh, if and Cook is paired with him. But can we play Cook this week or what's this injury looking like? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, he didn't play last week and, and he hasn't been practicing this week, so... We'll see, and they have a bye coming up, so it wouldn't surprise me yeah. if he sat again. Did you give a uh, eulogy to the flowchart based on Evan Ingram's result, or did I, did I miss that, or, or what happened there? Well, the flowchart is what? A tight end catches touchdowns. Tight ends just keep touching touchdowns against uh, oh, Arizona, so Red, right? Red Ellison counts. It, I mean, he's a tight... Look, okay, <laughs> we stream wide receivers against Philly, right? All the time. Why? Why do we stream wide receivers against Philly, Adam? I'm just saying that. No, 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 no. You got to answer the played, question. Don't pivot, Mr. Politician. If you Why do we Evan stream Ingram, wide receivers? If you played Evan Ingram, you got dusted. A little bit. A little bit. But that a was more bit. him being. A, he was a head case. Did you watch that game? I didn't. He was. Go watch the game back. Like the little 30 minute. He starts the game wearing gloves. And it was almost like he was allergic to rain. Because like he just seemed like he was going to melt 
or something was really going to happen to him. And he drops the ball with the gloves. And then he takes the gloves off on the side. Oh, these don't work in the rain. And then they throw him another ball in the flat on the right side. And he drops the ball with bare hands. Then he puts the gloves back on. He didn't know what the hell he was doing that week. It was just completely strange. I think it's a good bounce back week for him. But that's a whole other story as his prices come back down to earth. Uh, but a tight end did score again against uh, Arizona. It doesn't look like it was Swearinger that's the problem. It's just their scheme does not defend tight ends well. Uh, so I'm going to keep streaming tight ends against them. Just like I said, if we stream wide receivers against Philadelphia and because you played wide receiver X and wide receiver Y scores, oh man, you were totally wrong. You can't stream wide receivers against Philly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my thing is just I just play everybody against Arizona, but that that didn't work out yeah. that well last week either. So yeah, it was just play Chase Edmonds, and we would have if we had the news from them and they actually reported their injuries properly. So anyway, monitor all the injuries in this game because this is another game where we're in a holding pattern. Drew Brees changes things for me, at least in terms of Jared Cook. Not so much with Michael Thomas; he is quarterback independent. I don't care who's his quarterback; they're going to be able to complete passes to him. Like Adam said, downgrade his efficiency possibly a little bit uh, for Peterson, but he's not somebody that I want to avoid. And Alvin Kamara slash Latavius Murray is going to change everything if Kamara plays or if he doesn't play. So monitor all those injuries and let's move on with the slate. Uh, Bengals traveled to London to play the Rams in a home game at Wembley. Rams massive favorites here. The Bengals, one of the worst teams in the league at every single rushing metric. So Adam... Are you ready to play Todd Gurley? Because I don't know if I am. Yeah, I mean, one thing you see with with the Bengals is like uh, opposing wide receivers don't even do much against them or, you know, on an average basis because everybody just runs on them, you know? So uh, they just run, run, run. And, and yeah, to that end, Malcolm Brown still wasn't practicing as of Wednesday. Seems like it'll likely be Gurley and Daryl Henderson again. I mean, yeah, I mean, Gurley's just... If, for his health and uh, role, uh, he's too expensive, I think, at 7400 yep. despite the matchup. That said, uh, you could probably make a case that he's among the likeliest players on the slate to score a touchdown uh, in this game. Um, but, you know, uh, betting on touchdowns at 7400 is certainly uh, not something exciting. But, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I mean, the Todd Gurley thing like that, one game they played him like 90-plus percent of the snaps, and then the next game they play him 60. You know, I'm not sure they even know uh, what the exact plan is on a week-to-week -week basis. So it's hard for us to figure out. Uh, for the Bengals, you know, just more of the same. No A.J. Green, uh, one of the worst offensive lines in the league, and and no injury help there uh, coming. Uh, Joe Mixon just wasting his talent by, A, splitting it with Gio Bernard, and B, ramming him into the middle of the line with no offensive line. And Jalen Ramsey, I'm sure we'll see more of Jalen Ramsey. Jalen Ramsey played about half the snaps last week. He'll probably play uh, more this week. It's difficult, obviously, to see Cincinnati uh, getting much going here. You know, some people were asking me about like adding Alex Erickson and stuff like that. Uh, that that's not going to be for me. I mean, Jalen Ramsey isn't going to get Alex Erickson. Is no, he? that's I mean, not what I meant. He's going to get Auden Tate. Uh, I don't know. And I don't want to put you on the spot with like, where does he line up most of the time? Cause I don't know if you have that in front of you and I'm not trying to make you like say, I don't know stuff on the podcast, but like he's not going to like run into like the slot to chase around Boyd. Who's gotten tremendous volume, but because yeah. the bangles, I mean, I'm sorry, but bangles, you suck. And because they suck, he's getting like, he caught like 30% or 40% of the balls that were thrown to him last week. It's like, if you tell me that a guy that's 5k is going to get 10 to 15 targets, I'm going to want to play that guy. Unless his name is Tyler Boyd. So, like, is Ramsey going to go square up on Boyd or is he I just going to stay on the outside? Like, yeah, no, I mean, but... yeah, I mean, Boyd's not like a huge threat. I mean, he's still like a four six player. He's just like, you know, he's just good. I, I think Tyler Boyd is just good. He's had two horrible games. Yeah, he's a good games. football player. He's just had two horrible games back to back, you know, and, and I agree with you that his price uh, certainly stands out. Uh, I played Tyler Boyd last week at 5,600 and, you know, got it shoved right down my throat. So may, maybe I'll maybe I'll go back to it. I mean, the problem with Gurley to me, aside from the fact that, as you so eloquently put it, we're betting on touchdowns at 7,400. You got Uncle Lenny at 7,800. You got Kamara, if he plays, at 7,600. You have Chris Carson at 7,000. How the hell are we supposed to play Gurley at 7,400 with those three uh, volume monsters surrounding him on the salary show? Now, look, if you want to play him in GPPs and hope for a two-touchdown game and maybe he has 80 yards and four catches, right? Sure, I get that, but like... In a dream situation, can they just sit Gurley, not play Brown, and just let Henderson take all the all the England <laughs> snaps? 
Moving on to the Eagles and the Bills. Uh, Eagles front seven, obviously really good. Bills uh, defense as a whole, really good. We've got some good parts in this game, some players that look interesting. Uh, to me, John Brown looks super interesting in this game, but is Allen going to be able to find him down the field? Uh, you got any news and notes for us here? Yeah, still no Deshaun Jackson. I'd be surprised if he came back and played in this game. And you can tell it really hurts the Eagles offense not having like any playmakers at all down the field. Like everybody's working underneath. It. It's just a mess. And going up to Buffalo is a very difficult spot. Uh, Darren Sproles still not practicing as of uh, Wednesday. We saw Miles Sanders get a little bit of a boost in the past game with Sproles out. And then on the other side of the ball, Duke Williams banged up his shoulder uh, last week. And obviously they traded Zay Jones away. So they're starting to get thin there. Duke Williams may be able to play. Uh, we'll see. I'd love to see Robert Foster get another chance. But, you know, last week he was a scratch again, I think, um, which is crazy to me. They just don't me, like him. Yeah, they just don't like yeah, him. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think they just they feel like he plays the exact same role that John Brown plays. And, like, there's no reason to have both of them up, you know. So, But maybe Makes that'll sense. change if if Duke Williams is uh, is inactive. So that's, that's something to keep an eye on. But, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I do think Josh Allen, I mean, can exploit the, the Eagles secondary. I, I, I know um, Josh Allen is going to be aggressive. He's going to have one of the highest – Eight dots in the entire league. He had it last year. He has it this year, and and that's exactly where you beat Philadelphia. So yeah, certainly a nice setup for for Josh Allen. I don't know if you uh, ever look at the game cards on DraftKings, Adam. Like, uh, you ever look at like you know you click the player's name and it shows you like the card with the at yeah, a glance and game log and matchup. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like before, Cole Beasley had this like you know had this big smile and his eyes looked really bright and everything. And then you called him the king of dust last week. And now if you look at his game, his picture on the game log card, he looks just down on himself like you really affected this guy by calling him the king of dust and then he went out and he scored a touchdown like did he, he did you send him an apology note and maybe an edible arrangement or something he scored a touchdown and still had like nine DraftKings points 10.6 <laughs> <laughs> and he was like 5k he scored a touchdown yeah. and, he, and he still didn't beat a salary <laughs> that is so dusty if there's if there's anything that is the king of dust it, it's scoring a touchdown and still not getting there I mean, look, John Brown looks pretty pleased on his on his picture on his DraftKings profile. Um, again, if we're attacking Philadelphia, we're going to do it with outside receivers that can get down the field. John Brown's 5,900. The price has come up. Uh, he's been somebody that I've been on a lot this year, definitely through draft season, as well as in season as well. Uh, the volume has just been tremendous for somebody like John Brown, although three of the last four weeks, it's kind of tapered back with five, five, and six targets and three of the last four weeks, 11 against New England. But last week, uh, 83 yards and a touchdown, 19.3 DraftKings points. He's got to kind of get to that range now, right? Where he was priced before at 4,500 to 51 or 53. Uh, is it time to be a little more price sensitive with John Brown where he's now, to me, only a tournament player? I don't think he's cash game viable. I'm looking at cheaper wide receivers personally. Uh, is it time to just look at him as a tournament only play, especially with this matchup where all you have to do is throw the ball deep and within five yards of a receiver, and you're going to get either a pass interference call or a touchdown against this Philadelphia Eagles defense. And I'm not trying to get you, you know, uh, people coming after you with porches and pitchforks in Philly for saying this, but you know, you got to say something. Oh no, I couldn't care less about the Eagles. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah, I mean, John Brown only had six targets last week, you know? So, yeah. um, and that was a game which they were trailing to Miami, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, John Brown's getting, you know, he's in the Brandon Cooks range. Um, he's more expensive than Brandon Cooks. You know, he's getting closer to T.Y. Hilton. And, you know, I think he's the same price now as Calvin Ridley, who uh, gets a roll bump. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think John Brown is is out of play for cash, especially in this matchup. But it's certainly getting tougher, uh, I, I think. And, and yeah, I mean, he's so productive on his on his limited targets that, um, six targets for John Brown is probably better than eight or nine for Tyler Boyd, I would say, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, because of the board, the the boom bust. He's just so much likelier the, the to touchdown. Just, yeah, yeah, he's more likely to score a sixty yard touchdown uh, than somebody like Tyler Boyd. Yeah, I mean, he's just so much more likely to score a touchdown. Period. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of games where there are no touchdowns expected, I mean, there are some, but like the Chargers squaring off against the Bears in Chicago, Bears by five and a half here with a total of 40.5. Now, uh, Allen Robinson really only goes off when the Bears are down with about three minutes left in the game. If they're projected to play from ahead, what can we expect out of this game, Adam? Yeah, I mean, both of these teams are just having rough seasons from a personnel usage perspective, I think. And obviously, like Mitchell Trubisky is just a stark regression 
uh, is a problem for Matt Nagy. For, from an injury perspective, the Bears, I think, are pretty healthy. Uh, we saw how much they miss Akeem Hicks. I mean, it seems like a real thing. And that's one thing, like, I'm so adamant. I talked about this in the solo pod. I'm so adamant that offensive line, defensive line play is hugely important to fantasy and to game outcomes and, and under analyzed. But it's really hard to quantify the difference between Akeem Hicks and his backup. And it's difficult to quantify, like, exactly uh, how much uh, this stuff matters, but I do think it matters a ton. So I, I don't know. Um, from an injury perspective, Justin Jackson may be back for the Chargers, and they're such donkeys. I mean, there's really no room for Melvin Gordon, let alone uh, Justin Jackson. But they say they want to get Justin Jackson some work if he's back. Of course they do. Definitely. I mean, they're just such donkeys. Uh, and yeah, the last thing, you know, I like Allen Robinson. Man, he's playing awesome. He's getting open at will. I expect him to see a lot of Casey Hayward here, which you know, um, bad matchup. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's I a mean, tough matchup. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one that Allen can, can certainly win, but I just thought it was worth noting. I mean, really good wide receivers can beat any cornerback matchup, even the toughest of cornerback matchups. Yes, there are cornerbacks that can run hot and shut people down, whether it's for a month or for an entire season. Uh, Hayward, one of the top 10 cover corners in terms of PFF this year, but like Allen Robinson's a different kind of beast. He's, he's massive. He's very athletic. Uh, and they throw him the ball a ton, 25 targets over the last two weeks. Speaking of targets at a cheap price in this game, uh, Anthony Miller... Nine targets last week, seven the week before against Oakland, 16 targets for uh, over the last two weeks, averaging eight a game, obviously, quick maths. 3.5K. Is Trubisky good enough for us to actually warrant playing him? There's a few sub 4K wide receivers that I think are in play this week. We spoke about Deshaun. Uh, Anthony Miller, though, flying a little bit more under the radar than Deshaun Hamilton because of all the news about the Denver trade. 3,500 mm -hmm. for Anthony Miller. Is there any possibility for upside here or is Trubisky just Trubadsky? No, yeah. I, I mean, we've seen Trubisky play really bad and have these huge spike games. Like I have to go back yeah. to last year, but he had like Tampa 35 Bay. plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, DraftKings points like a few times last year. I think it's in him. Um, and yeah, Anthony Miller's usage has been has been good. I, yeah, I mean, he definitely crossed my mind for sure. I mean, it's in him, but can he find it? Like, can he access it is really the, the question. Yeah. Well, if I knew, if I knew that, I'd be, it before. I, I, if, I, if I knew if he was going to access it this week, I'd be playing the goddamn lotteries, Al. I, I mean, I was more asking rhetorically, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be in there with 150 Anthony Millers in the, in the million yeah. maker. Just lock button Anthony Miller for his incoming 35 fantasy point day. Uh, please do not add us if he does have 35 fantasy <laughs> points. Uh, Giants, ver or if he doesn't either. Giants versus Lions. Lions favored by seven and a half. They've been really bad against the run this year, which is shocking because you just talked about offensive line, defensive line. Uh, once Snacks went there last year, they became really, really good against the run. And also, we expected the Lions to be a very, very run-heavy team this year, and they just haven't been that. And it's possible because their defense has been so bad that they've had to open it up and throw the ball a little bit more. We definitely have some injuries that are going to make an impact on this game. Adam, give me the news and notes. Yeah, big revenge game for Snacks Harrison, too, here. I mean, I don't know how mm -hmm. good of terms he left uh, uh, the Giants on. Um, Has anybody left the Giants on good terms? <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, I think Saquon, I was encouraged that he handled, like, almost every running back uh, snap last week or in touch. Um, I was encouraged that he seemed to roll the ankle and come back in. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 I am hesitant to say that he's truly 100%. He's still limited in practice, and, like, high ankle sprains are tough, man, so... Uh, I'm hesitant to say Saquon's 100% doesn't mean he absolutely can't go ham in this game. It's certainly possible. Obviously, the big news in this game is on Johnson, unfortunately, landing on uh, IR. Um, they have four running backs on their roster now. Ty Johnson, who is a uh, kind of size speed uh, rookie out of Maryland. They have J.D. McKissage, who's mostly been used as a pass catching back in his career. They have Trey Carson, who was with the Packers in the preseason. Then they picked up and then they have Paul Perkins, who they picked up. Uh, from these Giants was on their practice squad and they promoted him. So they have four running backs active for this game. Given the way Matt Patricia has uh, bent us over before, I am hesitant to think that he's all of a sudden going to be like, yeah, this is the game. Ty Johnson, 25 touches. Mm -hmm. But Ty Johnson... Does he need 25 touches at 4.9K though? Well, right. He's 4,900. Uh, he plays well in the passing game. He has an excellent matchup. There, there's a lot of reasons to like Ty Johnson. It's just... You have to realize that you're probably not you're probably going to be sitting there watching the game and be like um, tilting so bad. What is Patricia doing? You know, he has McKissick in there. He has Trey Carson in there for some snaps. And like it's not Patricia's fault. It, it's uh, it's it's your fault for not understanding going into the game that Ty Johnson is not going to get every snap. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I, I like Ty Johnson. I want to think 
more uh, about it because the way DraftKings is pricing running backs now, like you, like last week, there were like four running backs around 5K who were like actual full time players. Like Carryon Johnson was 5K last week, and now Ty Johnson's 5K. You know what I mean? Josh Jacobs was 5K. Josh last Jacobs week. was 5K. Hey, you're, you can get so like if there's guys in that range that you can usually find 20 touches projectable from. I don't think that you can project more than if you if you're projecting more than 15 <laughs> touches for Ty Johnson. I kind of think you're doing it a little bit wrong because, as Adam said, you're putting yourself you're setting yourself up for a tilting Sunday. Yeah. Right. Um, Just because of who Patricia is. But have you seen the salad on Ty Johnson's head? Yeah. It's impressive. I mean, he should get at least a four hundred dollar DraftKings price bump just for that picture. It's awesome. Uh, for me, I want to play the passing game. A lot of red zone and end zone usage for both wide receivers uh, on the Lions. Marvin Jones Jr. and Kenny Galladay. Kenny, Kenny Galladay in a great spot for a bounce back game. Evan Engram's price has come down 1,200 point, uh, 1200 uh, DraftKings dollars this week. Also, in my opinion, that puts him back into the range. We haven't seen a price that cheap for him since week three when he played Tampa Bay and went completely bonkers. This is a really good matchup for him against Detroit. Detroit allowing... Uh, a league leading 10.5 yards per uh, attempt to opposing tight ends. They're letting tight ends run down the field. And Evan Ingram, uh, because Pete's not here, I'm going to say it. Evan Ingram, he's, he's an elite athlete at the position. Just a generational talent from a, yeah. from a spark score point of view. Uh, but I want, if I'm going to stack this game or if I'm going to attack this game, because this game is pushing a total of 50 uh, for the under, uh, for the over under. Uh, I want shares of Matt Stafford. I want shares of that passing game that's very uh, consolidated in terms of touchdown upside once they get inside the red zone to those exact two guys. Saquon Barkley is extremely expensive, and there are other players, as we just mentioned, or multiple players in the 7K range and 5K range that I think are going to carry more ownership, even though this is a great matchup uh, on paper for Saquon Barkley. It's very easy to be contrarian with great players in this game, and I don't think that people are going to want to click on Evan Ingram coming off of a game where he had a great matchup and and quite honestly stunk. And there are other players in his same range that they're going to click on before him. So you can get access in a lot of different ways to a game with a 50 point over under that sh just aren't going to carry ownership for a variety of different reasons. And yeah. the you know where the touchdowns are going to go. Yeah. And I would add, I think it benefits Evan Ingram that Sterling Shepard's not expected back uh mm -hmm. for this game because Darius Slayton uh can play more outside and won't command as big a target share I think as Sterling Shepard uh would have so um yeah we're getting close to having all the Giants healthy for Daniel Jones and we haven't seen a game, single game all year with Daniel Jones Evan Ingram Saquon Barkley Golden Tate and Sterling Shepard uh, I'm looking forward to that it doesn't look like it's going to be uh this week and, and yeah I mean passing game on, on both sides um is interesting you know Janoris Jenkins and DeAndre Baker are just playing so poorly for the Giants Golden Tate's been pretty good, but that price is scary at 5,800. Like, you never, you're never excited to click Golden Tate at 5,800, but he did have 20 targets the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. Moving right along, the Jets and the Jags. Ugly, ugly game, but there's one player that I know that we can roster in this game for sure. Uh, it is Halloween coming up very soon, and with Sam Darnold seeing as many ghosts as he has, they are four and a half point dogs in this one traveling to Jacksonville. If there's any news and notes, tell me about them, and then I'll let you sing the praises of one Uncle Lenny. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, Sam Darnold has had the mono, and now he had, like, some toenail thing. I think he had to ha have, like, his toenail ripped off, and he wasn't able to practice on Wednesday, and he's been limited, I think. He's going to play, but uh, still, it's just a weird thing for Sam Darnold. And, yeah, you know, another tough matchup for Sam Darnold. Obviously not as tough, and I think he'll be better, far better than he was against New England, but you know, the real payoff for the Jets passing game is coming in their upcoming schedule after this Jacksonville game, which is like five of the easiest games that you can find. Also, uh, DD Westbrook continues to nurse his shoulder injury, didn't practice Wednesday and Thursday. Still think he'll end up playing. And DJ Chark was a bit unlucky last week. I, I think uh, he got pushed out the one yard line. Um, but this is certainly an awesome spot. I mean, the Jets, in terms of talent and perimeter cornerback, is, is among the worst in the league. So uh, I think all those guys are in play. And then, yeah, you know, obviously. Um, Uncle Len is is uh, reaching the point where you can say he has Christian McCaffrey usage with just less explosiveness and less uh, and the offensive scheme as a whole isn't uh, as strong. But yeah, I mean, you know, we know Leonard Fournette is among the players most likely to reach 30 touches this week. 
He's also one of the players in the league, and there's a few of them on this slate that I think are in play and underpriced. I still think that Leonard Fournette is underpriced. All the guys that have the volume, he's approaching that place where he's priced appropriately, but he's not there yet. I believe he's an $8,500 running back uh, on DraftKings because of the volume that he's gotten. He is not that because he hasn't scored any touchdowns. He's got one touchdown on the year, but he's got 27 red zone touches so far, I've, or red zone I've, carries so I've far. I've watched him get stuffed at the one yard line so many times this year. They don't, they, they run this jumbo. He hasn't, he has and, not. No, I feels like I have. Okay, but, via PFF, he's got two carries on the year inside the five and one of them was a touchdown. Really? God. Yeah, that, I, I don't I know if that like, stat is correct or incorrect. It's probably because correct. 27 red zone carries, but two inside the five seems ridiculously impossible but one of those two turned into touchdowns adam you wrote a great article this offseason about how it's not the red zone carries that are important it's the inside the five carries yeah. uh that are really the most valuable but still 27 red zone carries and one touchdown that's a ridiculous statistical anomaly that should normalize itself and you have a really good matchup uh this week it's not the same matchup as the Bengals, but the jets have also not been an, uh, a fantastic team when it comes to efficiency, they've allowed like a touchdown on 30% of red zone carries against them uh, so far this season. They're allowing a touchdown on about 6% of opponents carry. So if he's going to get 25 carries, this is a spot where I think at least one touchdown is in play with a very good possibility of two. And we're, this is the last chance you're going to get, in my opinion, to roster Leonard Fournette at under 8K. That, yeah. That's going to be gone next week. Uh, I, I'm just probably thinking of all my players that I've played this year as a whole i've watched so many guys in that this jumbo package get like mm -hmm. you know like they try to hand it to them and they don't give them much of a running start and like I, I i hate telling coaches what to do but it's so efficient and it's like so uh obvious if you just look at what's been successful is spread and then run the ball you know or like quarterback sneak or anything except for jumbo and run the ball up the middle so i don't know man i i've just I, i've just been tilting um it's almost like i mean look i coach my kids sports teams now right i'm at that it's it, i'm i'm that many years old i'm that years old at this point where i coach my kids sports teams and like one of the things that you have to like tell kids in basketball and soccer and any of these games where like there's a ball on the on the court or the field and they're supposed to run freely or about don't run to the ball if you don't have the ball and one of your teammates does because not only are you not bringing yourself to position you're bringing an extra defender towards yeah. the person you're jamming up your teammate so what you're saying makes total sense you don't need to have three tight ends and one of them be a, a an extra tackle on the field once you get to the spot where you know you're going to run it inside the five put two or three wideouts out there move some guys away from the line of scrimmage give your running back more of a chance both with misdirection because you have the ability to pass it outside and because you're getting guys outside run them have them run against a lighter box when you get near the goal line but also, you got to give him the damn ball around the goal line, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's just, I don't know, so tilting. I can't even think of all the instances, but I, I know there's been a lot. Is there a, a playable jet in this game? Very simple question. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I still think, like, I'm not giving up on Sam Darnold because he got smoked. Uh, I'm giving know, up on him because he doesn't have a toenail. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Le'Veon <laughs> is, all, is, is going to bounce back and have better games. He's going to be using the pass game more, and, and Robbie is always a threat for a really big play. Um, yeah. Tournament I, only I, play for me though. For Robbie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Moving on to the next game. We have three afternoon games. At least there's a fun afternoon slate here and a couple of interesting plays in a couple of them. But here's a game that might be a little bit slogging. I think that at least one of the defenses is in play. The 49ers against the Panthers in San Francisco. 49ers favored by six and a half and a total of 42 and a half. Adam, news and notes. Yeah, I think this is likely going to be Kyle Allen's last start. Um, unless he comes out there and just shocks the world and, and sets the 49ers on fire. I think Cam Newton's getting close uh, to being back. So uh, last call, I think, on on Kyle Allen. Um, I don't really have any injuries to talk about here too much. I know I know the snap count on, on Tevin Coleman and Matt Breida was really out of whack last week, and I think a lot of that had to do with Breida. Like, I think he got poked in the eye or they checked him for a He's concussion. He's always got something. Yeah, but, I, you know, I think it'll be closer to the standard 60-40 this week in favor of Tevin and with Tevin getting all of the uh, goal line work. But, but yeah, I think, you know, Christian McCaffrey is going to be an example of paying up to be contrarian and hashtag defense doesn't matter. If you believe in Christian McCaffrey this week at 9,200, you have to say um, he transcends defense, which, which might be true. Like I'm not even saying sarcastically, like it, it really might uh, be true. 
Um, and you're you're not being overly price sensitive because he is 9,200. So um, yeah, it's an interesting game for sure. I mean, there's value to let us get there. Yeah, uh, for oh, we sure, can, right? Yeah, we can fit him. It was a different matchup. Yeah, you could get him for sure. Yeah, there's a 100% value to let you get there. Uh, for me, the Panthers are a big pressure defense and I love playing defenses that get a good amount of pressure on their opponent. That is, to me, the easiest predictor of uh, defensive success. They are priced down to a point where it's just a bit too far and squaring off against Jimmy Garoppolo, who's got six picks so far this season. Uh, it just looks like they're one of the cheaper. With the 49ers at 3,700, the Panthers should not be 2,400, in my opinion. I think that they're the best cheap defense on the board, especially with as much as they pressure. So sack possibilities, sack fumbles, definitely uh, with Jimmy Garoppolo at quarterback, you definitely have the opportunity to get uh, turnovers in the passing game as well. So I think that they're going to be one of the higher owned defenses, albeit I'd rather play defenses that are at home uh, than on the road. But th there's really no wide receivers I want to roster in this game. This 49ers defense is absolutely outstanding. I do think that people are going to go after Coleman, as you mentioned, at 5K with the amount of volume that he's gotten. But like, if you, is it wrong for me to say that I think that Tevin Coleman is touchdown dependent? Even with the volume that he's gotten, 20 carries, 18 carries, 16 carries the last three weeks, two touchdowns uh, coming two and three weeks ago against the Rams and Cleveland. But on volume alone, he has not exceeded 10 DraftKings points in any one of those games. He had 15 and 14 in weeks five and six, but he had a touchdown in those two games. Can Tevin Coleman get us 10 fantasy points without getting himself into the end zone? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of running backs like this, you know, um, yeah, they, they're not throwing the ball very much, period. Uh, and they're not throwing the ball to running backs that much. So, um, yeah, you know, the good news for Tevin Coleman is he's the no doubt big back. And and yeah, I should also mention that Manuel Sanders will be making his debut. I mean, they expect him to get in there and, and make his debut. Um, and, you know, we haven't seen him throw to wide receivers very much either. I don't know if that's because of talent or because of scheme. or They just haven't thrown the ball very much, period. It's just been kind of a weird season for San Francisco where they've they've dominated so much they haven't had to. Um, so yeah, we'll see. I, I I don't know. This seems to me like it's going to be very likely to be low scoring, but but we'll see. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. We don't need to spend much more time there. Moving on to the next game, uh, we have the Raiders against the Texans in one of the two games on the slate that is over 50 uh, expected points. 51 is the total here. Texan favored by six and a half. Adam, news and notes. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest uh, injuries of the week, uh, Will Fuller is going to miss this game with his hamstring pull. And, uh, you know, we have very clear cut roles now. We have DeAndre Hopkins across from Kenny Stills and we have Kiki Kute in the slot. And they're going to run that formation, uh, I think, a lot unless they get a big lead in which we could see them go with a lot of um, two tight end sets. You know, we've seen them do that some with Aikens and and Fells. But, you know, I think Kenny Stills is, is pretty safe for uh, a near every down roll here. And I expect him to be extremely popular. Uh, Josh Jacobs is dealing with um, a shoulder injury and it doesn't sound like a maintenance thing. Josh Jacobs shoulder actually seems legit banged up. So that's something to watch. And uh, the gazelle, your boy, uh, I don't know if he's going to play or not. You know, uh, he came out of the bye and still missed that game. So that was a bit concerning. Uh, if he doesn't play, I mean, they just continue to run this rotation at wide receiver, but they're using a lot of two tight end sets with uh, Fabian Moreau and Darren Waller. And, and, you know, um, obviously Derek Carr has, a uh, high preference when he drops back to look for Darren Waller. I mean, it, it, it's, and like with Jared Cook last year, I mean, Jared Cook had a massive outlier year for him. Uh, it's just where Derek Carr likes to throw the football is in the middle of the field. It's been a tendency of his for as long as he's been in the NFL. So um, yeah, I mean, Darren Waller's price last week was egregious. I think it was like 4,900. Now he's up to 5,900 and 4,700. Uh, it was even more egregious. It was, was 4,700. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and I still think he's underpriced. So um you think he's underpriced at 59 i i think he might be yeah i just it's wanted clarification on that no it's a that's a bold wild. statement i like that yeah, yeah i like that i mean dude's an animal he is and he keeps he could have had four touchdowns in that game last week right he had one called back and he fell on the one on a long on a long pass catch yeah so he could have just obliterated that slate last week he already uh, with 34 and a half points did ridiculously good Finally priced at a point where I think it's fair. Uh, but there's a lot of tight ends that are on this slate. That, and a couple of them that we didn't talk about. I, like I'm, I'm looking back at the slate and I'm, I'm remiss that we didn't mention Mike Williams for 
uh, and, and Hunter Henry for the Chargers, but whatever, mm -hmm. water under the bridge. A lot of tight ends in that price range this week. I spoke about this earlier, right? You've got Waller at 5,900, Hooper at 5,500 against a team that's just been really bad against tight ends in Seattle Seahawks. Um, Ertz is 51, but we're not playing tight ends against Buffalo. Henry at 49. There's a lot of guys in that range, and I think that most people are going to click on those type of, uh, on, on that range of tight end. Evan Ingram at 5,300. They're all kind of clustered in that 49 to 5,900 range. Uh, Waller has been the best in terms of volume, but Houston's been tough against tight ends. I know you don't pay much attention to, to DVP when it comes to tight ends, but schematically or personnel wise, uh, they've done well against that position. But Oakland just may not have anywhere else to go. So does yeah. volume trump that? Obviously, we, we're going to want to get access to the 24 targets and 18 catches over the last two weeks that D Hops had. You're going to have to reach up if you want to pay for that plus uh, Deshaun in your lineups, uh, which to me at 15K plus puts them in tournament only status. But who knows? I'm sure that there's people going to play that stack in cash. Yeah. Yeah. You can certainly fit in. I mean, Deshaun's an awesome play. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, Oakland's been a massive funnel this year. They've actually been pretty good against the run, and and they've been so bad against the pass, and they just traded away Gary and Conley also to to mm -hmm. the Texans. So uh, certainly a good spot for uh, Deshaun Watson. Yeah, don't disagree there. We're going to want to have uh, access to that game. Uh, there's three games on this slate that look most like they're going to be the highest percentage-owned stacks or stackable game-stacking games, uh, this being one of them, the Raiders against the Texans. Final game on the slate, Browns visit the Patriots. Uh, I assume that in the very nice defensive line, offensive line uh, article that, that uh, exists on Establish the Run, that this is going to be another situation where the Patriots turn out to be one of the biggest D-line versus O-line problems with the Browns having the O-line problems that they've had this year. I have not read the article yet. I'm just guessing. Uh, Adam? Talk to me about why we should not play the Patriots defense at 4,300. Yeah, I mean, it's getting hard to make a case to not play them at 4,300. I mean, it's not even their defensive line. Their secondary is so good. And we're going to see Stephon Gilmore likely shadow uh, Odell Beckham. And you can make a good case that Stephon Gilmore is the best cornerback in the entire NFL right now. Um, and with all the problems that Odell has had and Baker has had, you know, they're coming out of the bye. They're coming healthy. Hopefully they've had some time to regroup and reset. It's just such an awful spot for them to try to reset against. Uh, on the other side of the ball, Josh Gordon was placed on IR. They made the trade for Muhammad Sanu. I don't know how quickly Muhammad Sanu is going to be able to play. I kind of think that they still go with Edelman, Dorsett, and Jacoby Myers here and maybe mix Mo Sanu in a little bit. But I could be wrong. They could end up playing uh, Mo Sanu and, and kicking Edelman out wide more um, and playing him with Dorsett in that three wide set. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I want, I think to... people are massively overreacting to the Sanu, to the Sanus. I, I was going to say Sanu news and I almost like had a little tongue twister there. Uh, he, he, he isn't a guy who's going to soak up 20% of the targets. Yeah. And I think people are acting like, Oh, he's on new England. Now he's going to get 20%. No, he's not right. Well, like you got Edelman, you got white. They're a uh, low, those two guys they're kind are the of a low, beneficiaries. a low volume pass game anyways. Yes. Like I wouldn't, I didn't even try to add Sanu in any of my season long leagues. You know, maybe that's a mistake, but it I mean, wasn't that exciting. Even Dorsett in a limited role last week had four targets, right? I mean, granted, it was a game that they ran away from everybody and like the running backs had all the, the all the work. That's what we're seeing more is that Michelle as as inefficient as he's been on the ground, right? Like he just does not look like he's running decisively, but they're using him as the one and two yard line guy and it's resulting in a lot of different touchdown opportunities. Brandon Bolden getting a lot of usage uh, recently, at least more, uh, enough to tilt my face off, right? <laughs> Uh, with as much as I've been wanting to play James White. And I'm still wanting to play James White at 5,100. You're, you're getting a wide receiver one. Eight targets, nine targets, nine targets, 10 targets, each of the last four games as everybody on the outside is gone. And they're very easily convertible. Seven catches, nine catches, six catches, eight catches. I don't care if I'm not going to get 10 or 15 carries out of James White, as long as I'm getting a wide receiver one and a guy that has not scored, there is not many paths to failure for James White right now on the Patriots. He's had three touchdowns called back. He only has one on the year. Uh, if he has, you know, we talk about guys that can get there on volume alone. At 5,100, here's a guy that can get there on volume alone. And we know that we have a floor no less than 11.9 DraftKings points in any one game this year from James White. If he can actually find his way into the end zone and not have it called back for a flag, 
uh, we might be looking at a 20 plus point fantasy day at 5.1K. Mm -hmm. I prefer him to somebody like Tevin Coleman. And maybe I'm going to be, you know, I'll have egg on my face at the end of the day. Maybe Tevin Coleman will just fall into the end zone twice from the one yard line and James White will have another one called back for, you know, illegal formation or a pick play or something. But this is, this is where I'm at on a Thursday. Do you think I'm completely wrong there? No, I, I think the only argument I would have is uh, you're essentially using a running back spot on a wide receiver, right? And you said before you'd, you'd rather take 25 carries than 10 targets, right? And the targets to James White are so short and uh, mm -hmm. he can score a touchdown, but you're never going to get like a 40-yard play out of James White. So yeah, that would be my only argument against. But from a, from a floor perspective, you're right. I mean, James White, you're not going to find many guys at 5,100 with a better floor. That's a bit picky that I won't get a 40 yard play out of James White, considering that his long in uh, multiple games this year, 22 yard reception, 21 yard reception, 26 yard reception and 32 yard reception. He does mm. have big playability. Not 40, though. Not 40. You are correct. <laughs> Not a 40 yard. I will take multiple 25 yarders, though. You're correct. He has not had a 40 yard reception yet this year. Guys, that's going to wrap it up on the slate. Adam, you want to say goodbye to the people? Yeah, get in the listener league. Good luck out there in the lotteries. Uh, I hope you guys turn, you know, $4 into a million or whatever it is. It's been a fun season, but it's been a bit of a sad season through eight weeks. We have not had one Jerry Bark. She just lays there dormant in the background. I don't know if Adam's been feeding her uh, sausages stuffed with sedatives before each podcast, but no FedEx man has come to the door. We haven't had one Jerry Bark through the first half of the season. Sure. Maybe we can get her to pick that up in the second half because... Damn it, we need a Jerry Bark sooner rather than later. But for producer Luke, for Jerry, for Adam, and for Pete, I'm Al. We don't win a GPP this week. We hope that one of you guys do. Bye, everybody. We are promoters at DraftKings and also avid fans. Our usernames are Adam Levitan, Al Smizzle, and CSURAM88. We may sometimes play on our personal accounts in the games that we offer advice on. Although we have expressed our personal view on the games and strategies in this podcast, they do not necessarily reflect the views of DraftKings, and we also may deploy different players and strategies than what we recommended in this podcast.